Lion in the Wind, Chapter 17 Pentel and Welk sat in the back of their truck and tried to make themselves comfortable as it rumbled down a long, bumpy dirt road on its way to the front lines. The scorching noonday sun made the air around them rise in thick, sweltering ripples of heat that danced above the yellowing prairie grass like little pixies. The men adjusted their uniforms as best they could to compensate for the heat as sweat dribbled down their faces and arms. Welk grunted slightly as the truck hit a large pothole in the road, and tossed him briefly in the air before landing hard on the wooden bench that he sat on. Several other soldiers experienced the same thing, and muttered in complaint. Pentel soon looked across the aisle at Welk and studied the old sergeant's face. I bet you didn't think you'd be back on the lines again this soon, he said. Not really. But, then again, I'd rather be out here where we can do some good rather than sitting back at the labs twiddling our thumbs, said Welk. So where specifically are we heading, asked Sims. Pentel pulled a dirty piece of paper from his pocket and looked at it. Well, if I understand our orders correctly, we're to dig in along the line of hills not far from here and do our best to hold off the gorg as long as possible. Command is working to get us more reinforcements to solidify the lines, but those may not come in time. Welk rolled his eyes at this. Wonderful. So, in other words, we get to be a glorified speed bump again, he muttered. Pentel frowned. Hopefully this time we won't be. Yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. Just then the trucks began to slow and soon stopped. Are we there already? asked the soldier. Sims leaned over and looked through the back window of the cab. It looks like we're about to enter a rally camp, which means we probably are, he said. Are you sure? asked Pentel. However, before he could receive an answer, shouts began to rise up from outside their trucks. All right, everybody out. And I mean everyone. Came a bellowing cry. Ah, and that would be the welcoming committee, quipped Welk. I guess that answered my question. All right men, everyone out, said Sims. The men then quickly piled out of the truck and were immediately greeted by a crusty old sergeant who was directing troops and supply traffic. Where are you heading to? he asked Pentel in a gruff voice. Pentel handed him a copy of their orders. The sergeant studied them briefly and then gave the lieutenant a curious glance. Ah, you're those robot wranglers I've heard so much about. Command's been expecting you. They said to toss you on the line as soon as you got here. So where are we supposed to set up? asked Pentel. The sergeant pointed towards a line of low, gently rolling earthen mounds. See those two hills over there? You're to set up between them. The engineering boys have already dug your trenches for you, and set up your positions. So all you have to do is put yourselves in the holes and get your guns facing east. Also, when you get there, report to Major Tamago. He's responsible for that section of the lines. Pentel nodded. Thanks, he replied. The men then quickly formed up and followed Pentel to where the sergeant had pointed them. Upon arriving they checked in with Field HQ and were soon directed to a section of the line specifically prepared for them. When they arrived they were surprised to find that their trenches were indeed set up, and in perfect condition, ready for the fight that was soon to follow. Pentel surveyed the area around him, and asked, So what do you think? Welk studied the situation, and shook his head. We've definitely got the high ground, even though there's not a lot of height. The interesting part will be the approach area. That should provide us a nice kill zone. But, even so, I've got this sinking feeling that we're still gonna get run over. Pentel reached over and patted Tegani on the head. Let's hope not. We need to stop the Gorg soon because, if we don't, they'll drive us into the sea and exterminate every last one of us. Let us pray to Mishwa that they do not, said Tegani. So what's your thoughts on this? asked Pentel. Tegani scanned the area briefly, and then looked back at the lieutenant. I believe our position can be adequately defended. But it will take much courage and fortitude on our part to hold it. Yes, I agree. Even so, we'll give it all we have as I don't intend on handing the Gorg any more ground than they've already captured. Well, if we have our way, it'll take the entire army of Varric kicking in our front door before that'll happen, said Welk. Tegani looked up and noticed several Grek circling high overhead. 
that may very well happen before the week is through. Bergen stopped near the door to his office and noticed a strange expression on Persia's face. Something on your mind? he asked. She sighed. Just thinking about Tegani. I'm worried about him. He'll be fine. The improvements I made to his body make him nearly invincible now. Plus, he's a very smart lion, so I'm sure he'll come back to us in one piece. But the last time he went out, he was damaged after just one day of fighting, said Persia, with hints of worry sprinkled in her voice. As I said, he's much stronger now, so he'll be fine. But what if something does happen to him? I don't want him to die, said Persia, tears hinting at the corners of her eyes. Oh, Persia, said Bergen as he squatted down and hugged her around the neck. You've done a great job of being a mom to him. But now you have to let him go and trust in his abilities. But what if he dies? She asked, trying desperately to hold back her tears. He's got five other brothers and sisters, and a whole platoon of very brave men to watch over him. He'll be just fine. She thought about this for a moment and then wiped the tears from her eyes. Bergen leaned back to get a good look at her. He's saving all of us by putting himself at risk. Can you trust him to do what's right and come home safe? Persia sniffed, and then nodded. Bergen smiled. That's my girl. Welk studied the prairie in front of them through his binoculars and sighed. It's a little too quiet out there. They haven't moved or fired a shot all day. Private, what's on the radio? He asked. Not a lot. Just some light chatter. Most of the other units are just as confused as we are, said the radio operator. Welk looked at Pentel, and said, sounds like Tagani's guess may be right. If they're taking this long to resume their advance, they're likely in worse shape than they let on. Given what the 432nd did to them about a week ago, that's entirely possible. I mean, if I was them, and got my butt handed to me that hard, I'd be cautious too. He lifted his head slightly over the trench and peered across the prairie at the distant gorg formations. He ducked again when a bullet whizzed by his head. I see their snipers aren't sleeping on the job though. That wasn't a sniper. It was just a soldier taking a random shot at you. He is currently being scolded by his commander for his actions. Had that been a true sniper, you would be dead already, said Tegani. Sounds like they're anxious for the fight, said Welk. Or bored, replied Pentel. I would proffer that they are behaving this way out of fear, replied Tegani. Pentel smiled at this. Well, if true, that's a good sign, as scared people do some pretty stupid things, he said. Do you think we should send out a few men, and a lion to scout their lines? asked Welk. That would be ill-advisable. We are not in a good position to attempt such an effort at this time, said Tegani. Pentel raised his binoculars and briefly scanned the opposing lines. Given what we're seeing, I'm going to side with Tegani on this one, he said. Well, cursed. I hate waiting. I want to get out there and see what's happening. I feel left out. There is still several hours until sun's down. If they plan to attack, they will not begin until after dark. They'll need the cover of night to have any chance of success against us, said Tegani. Pentel looked out across the prairie and then turned to Welk. I agree. Sergeant, go tell the men to get some shut-eye as it's going to be a long night, and I'd like them somewhat rested before this all goes down. Yes, sir, said Welk. He then turned and slipped down the line as he passed the word on to each of his squad leaders. He returned a few minutes later and took up his position again next to Tegani. Everyone's been notified, he said. Good. Now you should get some rest too. You'll need it, said Pentel. I'm too wound up right now to sleep, said Welk as artillery thundered in the distance. Well, still try to get at least some. If things unfold like we're expecting them to, none of us will be getting any sleep for the next couple of days, said Pentel. Yes, sir, replied Welk. He then curled up in the bottom of the trench and closed his eyes. Within moments he was sound asleep. Several hours later he was awoken by a gentle nudge. I hear movement, came a familiar voice. Welk immediately snapped awake, grabbed his rifle and sat up. 
but he found that he could see little to nothing through the darkness. Tegani? Is that you? he whispered. It is. Good, because I'm blind as a bat. What do you see? The Gorg are moving. Are they attacking? No. They are merely changing their positions. A whistle and a pop echoed from behind them. A moment later an illumination flare lit up the entire battlefield in front of them. The prairie appeared to move for a moment and then came to a sudden and abrupt halt. Welk frowned. How close are they? he asked. About five hundred meters, replied Tegani. So they're still beyond firing range then. Actually, they are within our maximum firing range, but not our effective range. At that distance our bullets would have little effect. Then technically they're still out of range. Tegani cocked an eyebrow slightly. By your definition, yes, he said flatly. The flare eventually went out, turning everything black once again. Pentel squinted as he tried to stare through the moonless pitch blackness before him, but found everything mingling together into one muddled mass of dark gray shadows. I wish the moons were out. It would make it easier to see them coming, muttered Pentel. One of the moons is scheduled to rise in approximately 2.6 hours, but it will only be at one-third of its normal brightness, said Tegani. Anything will be a help in this darkness, muttered Pentel. Another flare might help, said Welk. Eh, they probably won't fire another one of those for at least a good fifteen minutes or more. They likely don't want to use up too many of them before the battle starts. We may not have the luxury of waiting that long, said Tegani. Why? asked Pentel. Because, they're beginning their attack. What? said Pentel in confused surprise. Just then the whistle of artillery pierced the air followed by the deafening roar of exploding shells as one after another began to fall on them in great raindrops of fiery steel. Here it comes. Keep your platoons under cover until the barrage stops, said Tegani over the radio to the other lions. The bombardment continued for nearly an hour before suddenly stopping for apparently no reason. It then resumed again shortly after but at a much slower pace, with the shells landing further from the front lines than before as though another artillery duel had begun. Tegani soon peered carefully over the top of the trench, his eyes piercing the darkness in hopes of detecting what the Gord were doing. But as he searched, he detected nothing. So he switched visual scanning mode several times to get a more complete picture of what he was seeing. Just then, out of the brilliant flashes of artillery fire, an image slowly formed in his mind. Vandros, he thought. Go to them Tegani, came a familiar voice in his head. What, thought the lion. The Dark One sends his minions to attack you and those with you. Go out and defeat them. Tegani wavered as he thought about what to do. His orders were to stay in the trench. But Mashua had urged him to strike out against the Vandros. Go, Tegani. You must attack them now, came the voice again. Tegani wavered briefly as he weighed the two conflicting orders against each other and then eventually sided with Mashua. Leave your squads and join up with me in front of the line. We've got work to do, he said over the radio as he slipped silently out of his trench. We were ordered to stay with our units, replied Sabo. Our first and most important duty is to protect those in our charge. If we don't go now, we may fail in that mission, said Tegani over the radio. Lead on then, replied Sabo. The other lions quickly slipped out of the trenches and melted into the darkness of the night. It wasn't long before Pentel's men realized that the lions were gone. Calls soon went out over the radio ordering them to return. What do we do, brother? asked Nikasa as she listened to the calls. We ignore them for now. We have more pressing business, said Tegani. After several moments they stopped and took cover as Tegani studied the small pack of Vandros gathered before them. Sabo, Nikasa, flank right. Rank, Pasa, down the center. Itaka, with me, we'll take the left. Our first objective is to stop the Vandros. After that, dive into the Gorg forces and attack their officers and command structure as much as you can. If you find the central command vehicle, contact the others and we'll attack it together. But, whatever you do, remember that stealth is of the utmost.
so bring them down quickly and quietly. Acknowledged, replied the other lions. They then quickly separated and began to head out after the Vandros. It wasn't long before the Vandros realized the lions had spotted them. Seeing that their cover had been blown, they came at the lions like a tsunami, their fighting spirit driven by an insatiable and powerful bloodlust. Within moments the placid silence of the battlefield was shattered by the sounds of violent struggle, as machine met monster in a bitter battle of strengths. Go for the head, it's their weakest point, shouted Tegani over the radio. Sabo, behind you, cried Itaka. Even as fast and strong as the lions were, they quickly found themselves fighting desperately for their lives. The noise of the battle soon drew the attention of the nearby Gorg troops who, assuming that a Yigsen raiding party had infiltrated their ranks, turned and began firing wildly in the direction of the noises. As a result, several of the Vandros were hit. This then became a surprise blessing for the lions as it quickly turned the anger of the Vandros away from them and towards the Gorg. But, despite the ferocity of their attack, the entire pack was quickly wiped out by an intense hail of Gorg fire. Now free of the Vandros, the lions turned their attention solely to the Gorg. Taking advantage of the black, oily residue left on their bodies by their brief battle with the Vandros, the lions were able to move through the prairie around them with even greater stealth than before as they searched for new targets. Gorg soldiers stood motionless in the now silent darkness as they anxiously clutched their rifles in anticipation of more surprise attacks. Suddenly, shots rang out from within their ranks. The soldiers flinched, but held their resolve. Then came a scream of panic and a cry of death. The soldiers began to shift nervously. An officer in the line soon grunted and collapsed to the ground, great slashes across his back. More screams and random gunfire echoed up and down the gorg lines. Soldiers on both sides were quickly growing nervous as they tried to make sense of what was happening. Stand strong men. The enemy is, ugh cried a Gorg sergeant. He stumbled briefly and then collapsed. Another soldier who went to investigate was immediately killed as well. More random gunfire and cries of panic echoed through the lines. Despite the iron-clad nerves of the Gorg soldiers, this had become too much. Intruders, enemy in the lines, shouted a Gorg sergeant. He then fell dead a moment later. This caused soldiers everywhere to nervously sweep their weapons back and forth in the darkness, uncertain of what was happening, or where this mysterious enemy might strike next. Some soldiers fell back and began searching their own units for signs of these mysterious attackers. Seeing these movements, others panicked and began firing on them thinking they were intruders in their ranks. This immediately caused a brief, but deadly exchange of friendly fire among the Gorg. What in the world is going on over there? asked Welk as he tried to make sense of the rapidly growing conflagration. I don't know. I can't tell, said Pentel as he peered through his binoculars. As he did, he saw a quick flash of oily gold and then another amidst a flicker of gunfire. What in the name of? muttered Pentel. Did you see something? asked Welk. I'm not sure, but I think I may have seen one of the lions. What? Where? asked Welk in surprise. He quickly raised his binoculars and peered into the darkness. After a bit he lowered them and stared in disbelief. What in the blazes are they doing over there? he asked. Tegani slipped between two vehicles and cut down an officer as Itaka jumped into a nearby jeep and cut down its occupants as well. As they continued down the line, Tegani noticed Gorg LAVs moving across the rear of the formation towards the right flank of the main assault force. Change of plans, everyone. We need to find a way to knock out those armored vehicles, he said to the other lions over the radio. Itaka leapt out of the darkness, cut down two soldiers, collected their grenades and then set them down at Tegani's feet. Will these do? she asked. He studied the LAVs briefly and then the grenades. These explosive devices are too small to harm them as their armor is too thick, said Tegani. Then use them to eliminate the crews and disable the vehicles from within, she said. Tegani thought about this briefly, and then nodded. Good idea. Let's do that. Both lions then picked up several grenades in their mouths and began moving towards the nearest LAVs. Attention, everyone, we have a plan. 
collect grenades, or any other explosive ordnance that is easy to carry and operate, and use it against the crews of any armored vehicles you find. The other lions replied in acknowledgement. Seeing an LAV passing nearby, Tegani quickly closed with it and jumped on top. He then briefly fumbled with the handle on the hatch before pulling it open. The two Gorg inside looked up in surprise and astonishment as the face of a lion appeared out of the darkness, his face illuminated by the glow of their instrument lights. At first they were confused at what was happening, but then became terrified as they spotted the two grenades in Tegani's mouth. As they scrambled for their sidearms, Tegani opened his mouth and allowed the two grenades to rattle to the floor inside the turret. The two crewmen scrambled quickly to grab the grenades and toss them out. But Tegani slammed the hatch shut before they could. Two dull thuds, and a puff of smoke erupted from the closed hatch. The vehicle rumbled forward several more feet and then stopped. It burst into flames shortly after, and began to explode as fire quickly spread to the ammunition inside. Another nearby LAV erupted the same way moments later, followed by yet another one further down the line. Tegani soon repeated the same maneuver on yet another nearby LAV as more exploded behind him. He paused briefly on top of the smoldering remains and surveyed the battlefield around him as Itaka turned and ran back to grab more grenades. As he stood there, a nearby LAV, coming to investigate the commotion, spotted him and opened fire. He quickly leapt to the ground as bullets whizzed by his head, and took cover behind the destroyed vehicle. The other LAV raced around the end of the smoldering vehicle and fired at him again, a string of rounds stitching the ground behind him as he vanished into the darkness. But, before he could get far, another LAV appeared and opened fire, its gun erupting with a staccato pop 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 as it fired at him. He quickly found cover again, but was flushed out as more LAVs closed in and surrounded him. Itaka, I could use some help over here, said Tegani over the radio. Give me one moment and I'll get their attention. Please hurry, replied Tegani anxiously. Sabo stood next to a pair of burning LAVs and listened to the radio traffic between Tegani and Itaka. Brother is in trouble, he said. We could run over and help him, but we might get trapped as well, replied Nakasa. Agreed. But we must do something, said Sabo. What can we do? Sabo panned the battlefield and then noticed a nearby radio truck. I have an idea. Follow me, he said. The two lions rushed through the darkness to the truck, quickly silenced the soldiers that stood guard around it, and then jumped in the back. What are we going to do? asked Nikasa. Play Gorg, said Sabo. Nikasa cocked an eyebrow in confusion. Come again. Sabo pointed to a long black wire hanging off one of the consoles. Standard J22F3 data connector. I'll plug in, contact their artillery, and request some support fire. But I'll direct it on top of their own troops. Mikasa smiled and nodded. Not a bad idea. Go outside and spot for me. I need exact coordinates. I don't want to hit Tegani or Itika by accident and I don't want anyone sneaking up on us while I'm calling in fire missions. I'm on it, replied Nakasa. Tegani nervously pressed his body against the shattered hull of a burning jeep and listened as two LAVs moved in on him from the left while another closed in from the right. Tegani, Itaka, can you hear me? came Sabo's voice over the radio. I'm a little busy at the moment, said Tegani. Get your heads down. We've got incoming on your location. Tegani furrowed his brow in confusion. Incoming, he said. Whistling sounds soon filled the air followed by the ground-shaking thunder of exploding shells. Great balls of fire rose up into the night sky around him like gigantic fireflies, their light illuminating the area in brilliant hues of red, yellow, blue and green. Then, just as quickly as it had started, the shelling stopped. You all right down there, came Sabo's voice over the radio. A little shaken, but I'm fine, replied Tegani. I am functional, replied Itaka. That's great to hear. I'm headed your way right now. Tegani carefully peered over the top of the jeep and studied the battlefield around him. He then stared in amazement at the scattered remains of the over half dozen LAVs that had been stalking him. He furrowed his brow in amazement. 
Were those shells just a moment ago you're doing? Yes. We took over a communications truck and called an artillery on top of their own men. Nice shooting, thought Tegani to himself. I appreciate the assistance. You saved my life, he said over the radio. You're welcome, came the reply. He then turned his attention towards finding Itaka, and was relieved to discover that she was unharmed. She looked a little rough around the edges, and had clearly seen far more action than she likely wanted, but she was otherwise unharmed. As she strode up to Tegani, she studied him with equal satisfaction. I see that you are undamaged as well, she said. You are slightly less so, but still sufficiently functional I see. I am. That is good. However we must get going. We still have much work to do, replied Tegani.